What is good, people? We're back again with another episode. I, I actually don't even know what episode we're on the, anymore. Um, but we've got the man himself, Mr. David Revan. You might know him famously from his FA Cup game against Spurs this season, or FC Marine. But also, I know him from his time with Liverpool, Tranmere, also his time up in Scotland, kind of scoring in important games, shall we say the least, against Celtic. So, how are you, mate? Yeah, very well, mate, yeah. Uh, yeah, sums it up, that, doesn't it? That's yeah. not a bad introduction, <laughs> is it? It's all right, isn't it? It sounded like God say it again. Yeah. <laughs> Good for the I, ego. I was going to say, mate. So, obviously, you're a northern lad through and through, and obviously started your career tram it. Is that, am I correct by saying that? As a kid, that's yeah. right, yeah. Yeah, lo- local team. Uh, Whittle boy, so they were the local team, yeah. Training with them eight, nine years old till I was 14 at which point I moved to Liverpool then so and then stayed there until I made, they made my first team debut and a few games after and left when I, I think it was 20 when I left um, left with a, like a year left on my deal but I knew I had to go and play I knew I had to go and make that jump and um, and, go and, and go and experience proper football because you know it just just the way it the way it was back then if you weren't playing football by the time you were 20 you were, you were miles behind we didn't have the under 23s then and so um yeah, just made the jump. Uh, Were you like cause... that as a as a kid? Were you like that kind of even like playing for Wirral and obviously as like a ten year old, twelve year old? Were you like even back then just want to play football? Just want to play football? Yeah, do you know it was. Yeah, people ask me. I've done a couple of like interviews and like say similar to this, and he say, you know, how did you get into it and stuff like that? And I, I was, all I can ever remember is wanting to play football and, and annoying the living daylight out of my dad saying, come out in the garden with me, come out in the garden with me, you know what I mean? And just having the lads in the street doing these little sessions in the street, you know what I mean? And I, I never thought it was going to lead anywhere, you know what I mean? It was only, I don't know, got to about, I was always one of the better players, but you never think that, oh, I'm going to be a professional here. And then um, it got to about 14 and it was a, on a Sunday night. It was just before I went to Liverpool, obviously. And, there was all sorts of scouts would ring. I didn't have my mobile phone then, so it would be the house phone would ring and Blackburn, <laughs> Everton, United, you know, all the, all the teams on the northwest. And I went to see them all. They give everyone a fair shout. I went to, um, they put me in a box at Blackburn. I went to uh, meet Joe Royal at Man City. Um, all this sort of stuff is great. And um, it was at that point where I was thinking, well, oh, he's getting a bit serious here. And then the year after, I, was, I started playing for England and um, that carried on till I was 20 as well. So, that's, that's when it started getting a little bit like, oh, like this, this might go somewhere, you know. And I just then, I just then expected things to happen. I didn't, mm. you know. You talk about people talk about belief in, and you know, say like we're talking about coaching, so trying to get self belief into coaches. For me, I was that tunnel visioned, and I look back now, I didn't know it then, but I was that tunnel visioned. I just didn't think anything else was going to happen except mm. me being a footballer at that point. Um, and so that was a, pro, I suppose, a bit of self-belief that I took for granted at the time um but I look back now and I think it was probably quite strong mm. do you think yeah. that do you think if obviously all coaches will know this and I think football fans in general and you see it I've got there's a pitch outside of my house and you see kids there just playing all the time or playing with their dads and stuff I cannot like you saying then obviously you didn't even think about it, it just playing football mm. how many kids coaches <clears throat> will we see on a daily basis that are eight years old and they're Every single one of them is like, oh, sign for this academy. I want to sign for this academy. Oh, I want to do this one of that. Tell me about and it's just it. like, yeah. and I think I look at it, you think if you were in this day and age, well, I say day and age, but just flip forward now with like a 12 yeah. year old yeah, boy, yeah. do you think yeah. that's where kind of coaches at grassroots level maybe don't instill just playing football enough because of all the pressures of, oh, we I want do. to win. We've got to have the, oh, I want to, I want to be known as the guy that took. This player I, I couldn't agree with me more what you've just said. I totally, 100% agree with it. And um, players come and say to me, um, even like off season, what should I do? I was like, go and put two good jumpers on the floor, mate, and play. Go and find a ball and kick a ball against it. Like, do whatever you want. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Like, parents ask me, I was like, just let, let him play. Can he play on a Saturday and a Sunday? I'm like, yeah, of course he can. Go on. Like, <laughs> you know, I do. And I think, I mean, I had a. A friend whose boy is five, I think, or even younger, and he, Liverpool wanted to go and train at the academy, and they asked my opinion, <clears throat> and I said, if it was my son, I wouldn't send him. I just wouldn't. But he can go and get what he gets there down the road, and he's just going to kick a ball. So 
I mean, I've got a son, he's, uh, he's going to be four next month, and I don't want him to go anywhere near that sort of environment until, you know, you're 10, 11, 12 years old at least, and um, I don't think there's any need for it. Go and play with your school teams, go and play every other sport that's going under the sun, because it'll make you a better footballer anyway. And I think um, go and a lot... A lot of people always ask me on like all like social media, on TikTok, all these different things on YouTube. Oh, like what? How? How can I get scouted? How can I kind of? How can I get this? Fine to ask, but yeah. if it's, it's it's bad to say, it, but if you are good enough, yeah, yeah, you, you'll get. When you hear these stories, I remember Chris Wilder saying how he would be in his local local boozer in in Sheffield, and people go, oh, "I could have been this player if if this." Is, story. He said. Yeah, but you didn't. And if you, you if didn't. you were good enough, you wouldn't be saying talking to me. And it's yeah. I think do you think looking back now on your kind of journey as as a youngster, was that down to kind of your upbringing in kind of the area that you lived in? Everyone was just kind of like, let's just play football. I don't all I want to do is football. Was or were there because I know we say about parents, so mm. many parents kind of talking now about how can I get my son scoured? How can I get this? How can I get that? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, do you know what? I mean, probably you're probably right, yeah, because it's all we ever did, and it's uh, just hours and hours out in the out in the park or out on the, out on the, the street in front of us, and mm-hmm. um, and I just found that it came quite easy to me compared to some of the other kids, and now like me mum and dad, they didn't they didn't even think about it if they didn't. I mean, as you just said, then you've got five, six, seven year old kid. How can he get scouted? And my my mum my mum was surprised. She said, <laughs> "Is he good? Coming? In. Yeah." She said, <laughs> "He kicks it and falls over. What are you talking about?" <laughs> and uh, so yeah, it maybe it was just the you know the environment I was in, and because I mean all through my career I've noticed that there's been like for instance when you get into the first team it's dog eat dog you know mm. you've got somebody who wants your position, and so many times so in my career I've had lads who come in been a better player than I've been, technically better, mm-hmm. and just lacked something, um, and I've. My, my desire or work rate, whatever, has, has, has just been better and, and, and I've ended up getting me placed back. And that's just that, that, that has happened so many times. I could rattle off a number of names now in non league mm. who should be playing in the football league. Oh, yeah. Um, like, and I think, I think you see that like, when people say, Oh, how? Or, like, oh, like, or you see it down at like, the local power league and you'll, you'll see yeah. it with your son yeah. and stuff as he gets older. And I saw it as, as me kind of a couple of years back at university. You're thinking, How is this guy not? Play, oh, he was playing. Oh, I was playing for Crystal Palace. Why? Why are you not now? Oh, I don't know. It was clearly not because you're technically. It's something else. It's that, like yeah. you said, that desire, that that will yeah. to kind of want to get better. Yeah. But what was it like yeah. going in your first day signing for Liverpool? Like, what was that like? As a Liverpool fan, it's it's the dream it that was, you won, mate. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there was two. There was a couple of different moments in in that. So I mean. The first time going into the academy when it was brand new and built, I mean, that was, I went there because the facilities at Tramia weren't great and I was getting games called off left, right, and centre. And I was like, what am I doing? Because I love Tramia, I wanted to stay. And I just couldn't turn the fact down that I'm going to train here every day, like, mm-hmm. or however many times a week it was. And uh, that was amazing. And I remember feeling like, wow, I feel like I'm footballing now. And, and the next time I was walking into Melwood, I mean, that was more of a, whoa, this is big time stuff, you know, walking mm. in and sitting next to Stephen Gerrard, tying up my boots and like, wow, I was overawed a little bit at times. Um, and that was a, they were, they were big moments and you've just got to sort of like, right, stand up tall, put your, put your shoulders back, I fit in here. Um, now, like, I probably didn't believe in myself as much as I should have done at Melwood. I was surrounded by like superstars and thinking, why do I actually belong here? You know, sort of thing. And that took a little bit of uh, getting used to. What year Um, did you sign again? So I would have gone uh, when I was 14. um, But when I signed pro, I I signed pro when I was 17. So that would have been in 1998. Is that right? No, no. Yeah, yeah. Give or take. Um, Yeah, so... So we signed professional contracts when we were seventeen. Then, and obviously, it, it ran until I was uh, it ran until I was twenty one. But left when I was twenty. Yeah. What was so you speak about? Obviously, Gerard and I've, I've looked into a number of interviews. And I think it's quite. Yeah. I think it's quite yeah. easy to kind of know, obviously, who the probably your best player you ever played played or trained with or, or been a part with. How good was that team though? When you were going in, kind of training with the first team, or I. Was that was Owen still there at that point? Yeah, I remember Michael Owen. Uh, he was when I just went there. He was on his his way out. Mm-hmm. Um, the likes of Emil Heskey and that as well. 
Um, I mean, it gets a bit of stick that team. They're not being. I mean, that two thousand and one cup Trouble. winning team. Yeah. yeah, that that was that was a top team. It was like a couple of years after that gets a bit of stick, and Stevie Gerrard like pulled it through. Mm. And uh, he on a trainer pitch. I mean, we also always like on a on a on a Saturday. Everyone saw that, but on a trainer pitch, everyone said, like, "What was he like?" I'm like, "However good you think he was, times it by ten when you're up close, really? like training with training with the guy. Yeah, when he's stuff he could do with the football, his, his body shape, his athleticism, his aggression, his his mentality. The man was just like phenomenal. He just walked into a room and owned it. And then, um, yeah, I just always think, wow, yeah, what what a play! It was an absolute. I look back and think that's just. Privilege to be able to say I've played in Spain with this guy because mm. um, he was the best. He was the best in the in the world for years. You know, good three or four years. So, uh, but wow, up close, he used to do these passes like that. He used to drill straight, and then say he was in the centre of the park. Say he was doing a crossing and finishing drill. Mm. He'd zing it where it would just just bend off at, at, at sort of like the last minute. I'm like, how do you do that? <laughs> how do they go straight or with bends? But he used to do both. He used to drill it straight and let it bend at the very last minute, just in front of the uh, the winger to come in for a cross. I think, how do you do that? I don't know if you can teach that. You know, I don't know. I don't know how you coach that. I don't know. You, I don't know. It's just natural ability. I don't know. And what was 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 it Gerard Houllier at the time? Was was he the manager? Ule and then Benitez, yeah. So yeah. more, so what, I, sort of more so Benitez in my time there. What was the difference? And I think a lot of people can kind of say the the differences between the two. But what was it like to work under both? Uh, see, I was still still a younger boy. And it was that sort of long ago. Um, I mean, I touched on Gerard Hule. He was like at the end of his time. He he just looked like a lovely guy. Everyone loved him. Um, that's the the vibe I got from him. The vibe I got from uh, Benitez was more of like a a schoolmasterish vibe. I mean, I think it was because his his English wasn't great still, so he just like had to tell you straight what, what it, it is, was. Yeah. yeah, and he got like sort of a cold reputation for that. And I don't know whether that was his fault. I think it was just a, a language barrier. Um, I mean, remember we we're talking about a contract, and he said to me, uh, he said, "When do you, when does your contract finish?" And I think it was I was like, "I'll finish next year." And he went, "Right, come and see me." going to sort you out a new contract and I said wow great brilliant I'm over the moon mm. and a week gone two weeks gone I didn't hear anything so when I knocked on his door and I said I was like gaffer like nervous as anything I said uh reminds me you mentioned this contract a couple of weeks ago and he's like yeah and I was like I haven't heard anything since he went sign it and shut up and I was like okay <laughs> See you later then. Bye. So that was uh, that was the sort of dealings with him, and I think he just thought that I was going in moaning, but I wasn't, you know. So it was. I think that was just a language barrier. Did he did he do that with all the players in terms of his demeanour, or was it because I've, I've obviously you've seen loads of interviews with players, and at, at that time, like when he kind of Julier was on his way out, Benitez mm-hmm. was on his way in, and obviously he wanted to bring in, like he just won the La Liga, he's done all these things. Yeah. He wants to bring in obviously a, a different type of player. Yeah. Do you think and it might sound weird me saying this, but like you being English and not being maybe a, a flair type of player, let's say, or a flair centre back or a flair kind of defender, yeah. do you think that maybe had the difference? Or what was some of the, the kind no, of No, you're probably right. On? Yeah, because he did he did bring in a couple of lads who um who were in my position. So for instance I don't know, I'm sure he came under on the Benitez, says a like Carl Majani, ended up having quite a good career, ended up playing in the World Cup and stuff. He was captain of France, uh, the same age as me, but I was captain of England and he came in, same positions. I was like, why do you need to bring this guy in? Like, you've got a captain of England in your team here, like mm. the same age, why are you bringing this guy in? There was no need for that. Um, and then another guy, um, BBB, B, uh, he was another right back again, went on to have a good solid career, but he was mm-hmm. a Spanish right back and there was no need for it. He was never going to play for Liverpool, but all he was doing is hindering me and my development because it was just another obstacle that I needed to overcome. Yeah. Um, and again, these guys had great careers, but not at Liverpool. So why bring them in? There was no need. But the ones he did bring in, obviously, you know, your Garcias and Alonso was it as well, but they, they were exciting players. I remember they on the training pitch you know we were like wow we hadn't seen stuff like this before mm. we hadn't seen you know the flicks around the corner that all, all the <laughs> flair play that they brought and they, that was exciting that was great i really remember like that stood out massively lewis garcia stood out like a, for me in training like a sore thumb as you can imagine small player training player you know mm. but yeah it was um, exciting times and obviously like with benitez and and 
I think as he's maybe got older, it's kind of changed a bit. But kind of, you you could kind of see that as a fan, like when he first kind of came in, just before obviously the Champions League win. I remember, oh, what was it? I think it was the game against Chelsea when, when at Anfield semi final, when they went to the against AC Milan the second time round. I remember him oh, just yeah. sitting on the floor, and I'm thinking. Like, do you do you want all the attention, or is this, or is this just you? And I and I look back at now, and I think maybe that's just you shutting everything out, and you don't want to hit. Because even when they went through, I'm looking at him thinking, no emotion, no kind yeah. of. And was that was that him on literally on a daily basis? Kind of, he sees you as kind of not machines, but he yeah, has probably. a way of playing. Was he quite yeah, different probably. players? Pon- yeah, yeah, I mean, well. Yeah, it was my sort of first encounter of like, you know, that environment and management and stuff like that. So didn't have much to compare it against. But uh, being a younger boy, I mean, there's loads of players there anyway. Yeah, he was quite distant. But I mean, at the same time, the man grafted, you know, we used to play reserve games. Say we'd go and play Newcastle away and all the reserve games were always evening games. And we'd come back, say, 12 o'clock at night in Melwood uh, later sometimes. Mm-hmm. And the manager's still there. The manager was still there. He'd be in his room. Light was on. And he was still there working. And I'm thinking, wow, this guy, he like he impressed me like that a lot. Mm. He was always there, always working, first in, last out. And so maybe that was it. And, you know, he was that focused on what he was doing. Obsessed kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. So maybe the emotion sort of was seen as a hindrance in his eyes, possibly. You'd have to ask him that. But maybe that was the reason, because he was an absolute grafter. Mm. What mm. was, do you think then, talking on that, like you said about the grafter, do you think, looking at the kind of English players in that team, like like you look and speak about yourself or, or, or Gerard or Carragher, like you're all gonna put a shift in. You're all gonna put a shift in and you have so, and you have technical ability as well. And do you think for him looking at these types of players, he's thinking, I need you to be at this kind of level technically and you've got all the kind of work rate. And do you think other players he kind of was like, if you can't get there, I'm gonna bring in someone else that has that flair kind of side to it? Yeah, I think you're probably right, yeah. Um, when I mean, I must admit, I was pushed at one point. So we had Steve Finnan and a lad called Yossami. That was it at one point in front of me. And um, after it made me debut and, and with that spares. And uh, Alec Miller, the first team coach, he's like, stop being steady, Eddie. It's like, you, you've got a right chance here. Yossami's not up to much. He's overweight. He's not fit. Um, I think Finnan was like injured at the time push 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 like and I was like I don't know what else to do I'm trying I, I'm, I just lacked that flair and I was a steady eddy career all my career and that's the way I was and I, if, I, if I had a step over in me I'd have used it but I didn't you know what I mean so, like, maybe just and that was the reason like I can use myself an example why yeah they were they said he's ready he's ready I mean, they were talking about me like he's ready to play and mm. um, but he never just he never gave me the chance as such I mean the games are played and we lost Apart from Spurs, I played against Crystal Palace, we lost. Southampton, we lost because it mm. came on. Uh, Burnley in the FA Cup, famously. Jimmy Traore, we lost. Yep. So there was plenty of games I played in that we just didn't win. <laughs> so it was like, um, what do you want me no to do? fault. <laughs> yeah, no fault of my own, you know. So, um, yeah, you may be right with that, definitely. Yeah. How good was Carragher? Obviously, you're talking about yourself and defensively wise. How good was Carragher in that team? He was brilliant, wasn't he? I mean, for someone who, I mean, you look at Gerard and you talk about he had everything, like Carragher yeah. didn't. I mean, massively made the most of what he did have. His personality on the pitch was huge, wasn't it? Mm-hmm. Um, I think he was in the right place at the right time. So, men, like, sort of defending wise, he was he was switched on. Th- those, like, those tackles he made aren't by accident, you know what I mean? That's, that's years in football um, intelligence, isn't it? Mm-hmm. But he, I mean, yeah. Would he have played it in this team now, Liverpool team? I'd probably not, you know. This yeah. is the thing that I look back now and he played five, six hundred games, whatever it was, seven hundred games for Liverpool. And would he have done it? Absolute in legend. Would he have done it now? Yeah. And you think would he have got the chance now as 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 he did back then? I don't know. He he'll argue he did, I'm sure. Mm. Uh, he would. And and rightly so, because he was an England international as well, don't forget. So he was um but yeah, he he's the epitome of what like I think Liverpool fans like to see, don't they? You know, mm. putting your life on the line every single week, and that's what he did. And he led by example, and that. And yeah, God, I looked up to him massively. And you know, he was a big sort of icon for me, hero of mine. You know, when mm. I was there, like, how does this guy do it? 
like I want to be like him sort of thing yeah. so yeah and how is that um, kind of at what point during that kind of stage in your career were you like I need to leave at what point it was it was when I played the games and we played by Leverkusen away and I was on the bench Steve Finnan um, had come off injured and we were winning something like 4-1 or something the game was over there was only 20 minutes left or something mm. like that the tie was over and um Benitez had a chance to put me on and I was thinking this is it I'm going on and yeah. he put Antonio Nunes on instead and Antonio Nunes had got two left feet and like, he was just awful I like, honestly <laughs> the worst player seen at that level and he put him on in front of me and he was a right wing and he put him on right back I thought right hey, that's like big sign to me that yeah um and so after that a couple of my mates had been going and playing and like Zach Whitbread went down to Millwall down at Potters down at Southampton Neil Merler down at West Ham and you know all, all my peers were gone they were all playing in the league and I was desperate I was desperate to play all the lads at England I was mixing with they'd all played 50 games in the championship and I was I hadn't played a game I played four games for Liverpool so I felt like I was miles behind and so it was that point I was like I need to go and play otherwise I'm going to rot I went back to the race course ground where we used to play our reserve games walked out and there was no crowd and I was so flat and I thought wow I need to get out of here now yeah. I'm done this is me done I can't do this anymore sort of you know, sounds great. People saying you're captain the reserves, but I just couldn't do it anymore. I needed yeah. to play, you know, proper football. So that was that was then. And was at that point where you kind of looking just to get out and, and just play as much as you can. And obviously, from from Liverpool, yeah. where where did you go after that again? I got I went alone. I went alone at Tramia for the remainder of uh, 2001, I think, season, and then um, they wanted to sign me after that. Even even though I didn't really enjoy it too much. And then I went up to Carlisle. Um, it was a point. It was just a case of I need games. I need to play. I need to be a professional footballer because otherwise, mm. I'd also seen so many boys, by the way, come through the England youth fall out of football, and I was terrified of falling out of the game. And it was one of the reasons there, as I said to you earlier, if you're not like if you haven't got games on the belt by the time you're twenty back then, you were out of it. Do you know yeah. what I mean? So it was, it was, it was that. It was, it was a fear factor of like, right, I need to play quickly get games, be established, you know. And did you go straight into that, that Carlisle team, obviously? Yeah, yeah, I went straight in. Yeah, yeah, it was, I mean, that was, it was great team on the up as well. It was, um, oh, the average crowd up there, you know, you're seven, 8,000 compared to what it is now. And mm -hmm. it's, um, it was great. I mean, it was a big learning curve for me because I went up there, I was away from home. I struggled, homesickness. Um, my form wasn't great in the start when I went. Um, I had to win the fans over. I got a lot of stick. I mean, the guy who I, who I replaced was actually the player of the year, the year before. Oh, and yeah. a big, big fan's favourite. used to sing his name when I was playing. I was like, <laughs> honestly. So, like, I look back now and I didn't half put airs on my chest. Though. Mm -hmm. and, um, so, yeah, that was, that was just it was such a good learning curve, that was. Um, and then after that, I was really successful and we should have gone up to the championship. We had great players like Danny Graham, Joe Garner, Kevin Westwood. Mm -hmm. uh, Richie Kill came later on, so top players you know in the team a really good time and what was that when you obviously left Carlisle was it like right I want to see where I can go next ahead and were you always trying to look upwards uh, always yeah I was always trying to move, like look upwards we should have gone to the championship that was a big regret of mine um, and then I pulled up with a big injury and needed a hip arthroscopy which kept me out for six months and that was a major turning point in my career um, at that point there was a few big clubs looking I was speaking to Norwich, Huddersfield, people like this, and then I broke down with an injury, and then um, I just couldn't come back from it, and it ended up uh, needing surgery on my hip, and I just uh, it cost me two, three years. Then the next two or three years was just stop, start constantly, just couldn't string games together. So um, went to Shrewsbury, went to Tramia, same story there, twenty odd games, released because I was injured, and uh, was just breaking down, and then eventually. I went up, to, it was like last chance saloon up at Inverness, Terry Butcher rang, went up there and managed to string together 40 odd games that year, amazingly. And look back now, I can only think it was because we had an international break at the end of each month um, at the start of the season yeah. and it enabled me body to get used to the rigmarole of it again. So yeah, and then that was successful after that, yeah. What, at what point were you like, or did you go up to Inverness thinking, oh, this is, well, I could stay here for a long time or was it just, because obviously you were there for a, Obviously, yeah. your longest longest point in your career. What was? Did you kind of go up there thinking? Because there's no disrespect to the Scottish league, but when you look at the Scottish league in comparison to say other leagues, 
people first of all look at it like, oh, it's a stepping stone, should we say? Or were you still at the same minds that just, I want to play football? Yeah, I was like that. They, I mean, funny enough, they, they sold it to me like that, saying, if you come up here, you do well. It's a springboard somewhere else you play, you know, because it's big, like, exposure. But I, I just wanted to, like, I was just happy to go up there and play. Like, I, it, for yeah. me, it was, a step, it was a step forward, and I've been at, give, given this gift because where my career was going at that point in time, it was absolutely nowhere. And I wasn't really enjoying the rigmarole of League One and, um, you know, it's just samey, samey. I went up there and I felt like a footballer. I was played in big stadiums, games, big teams and, um, you know, big games. And you're treated, like, for instance, the papers treat the premiership up there like our papers treat the premiership down here. Yeah. And it was, and it was brilliant to be part of that. You know, fine, getting to Europe, playing in cup finals, semi-finals, stuff like that, you know big 60,000 seater stadiums full. I mean, that was like what it's all about. And I loved it. And at no point in my time up there, I thought, yeah, I want to go back down south. Not one. I was not as happier up there than I was down here. And uh, was, so, was it hard to kind of, or, or what point was it for you to look at your career or look at your time at Inverness and go, no, I'm, I'm the man now. This is my place. And you were given the captaincy, obviously. We yeah, captain captain a then? few times. Yeah, yeah. I was... Um, when a captain wasn't playing, yeah, I was never like established captain. But I felt I've come into me peak up there as I often read, I often read about it, that golden period of 28 to 32. Mm. And it, it was for me, it really was fit, strong. And you think, I remember a coach, John Owens at Liverpool saying, you'll get to 28, you'll think this will go on forever, this, this will go on forever. And you do. Mm. And you get to 20, you think, oh yeah. You get to 30 and you think, oh, I can go on and on here because you are so fit and strong. It's a joke. And then all of a sudden, it's taken away from you. <laughs> like it's, and it's, it's just decided for you. Um, you know, not like the Paul Scholes and Gerrards of this world who announced yeah. the retirement. It's just, it's taken away from you because you, people go, oh, all right, he's past that age now. He's off. So he can't, he can't be any good, yeah. Um, no, so, yeah, I, I just found it came into my own a little bit up there and we had a um, good mixture again, but it's, it's just luck that we had you know, good young players, experienced older players at, in their peak. And yeah, it was a really good time. What was it like, obviously, playing against that that kind of Selwick and Rain, Rangers team during that time? It was great, yeah. I mean, the Rangers... How good were, were they? they were, Celtic, uh, the... I mean, we, we went toe-to-toe with them a few times when we, when we were good. The, the problem with a club like Inverness, like any small club, it's a selling club. So the minute yeah. you do well, the big, the big boys come knocking and they get your best players. Of course. Now, when, when we were good... We were going to toe, toe to toe with Celtic and, and giving them a right good go, and we beat them at their place, or we beat them in the semi final of the cup, say. And um, you know, we we were good for our for our money. You know, we we finished third in the league that year. We should have finished higher. We should have finished second. Um, so, but after that, I mean, we took a couple of batterings off them as well, by the way. So when Brendan Rodgers Celtic came up there, they they put like six past us. Do you know what I mean? And they, they could have been it could have been ten stuff like that. But by that time, we were a different side or whatever, mm. and different manager but yeah they were good when they were good they were good do you know Celtic especially at home um they had the fear factor there they had the that crowd the place. yeah when it was bouncing we played them last game of the season they needed to beat us to win the league and it was absolutely just booming I thought mm. wow this is proper like so yeah when they were good yeah they were good <laughs> yeah was it at that point in your career obviously you're a lot you're a lot older at this point was it for you and obviously playing in the defensive line, was it like, right, what can I do here? If you had like a youngster beside you, could mm. you, when you, it's quite cliche, but could you kind of look at them and think, I know exactly how you're feeling right now. Like as a 21 year old, 20 year old with yourself, or was you quite experienced at this point? How, how is that kind of coaching a player through the game? Obviously we see it with Liverpool right now. Yeah. I mean, no kind of leader or there, but you look at like mm. Van Dyke. Yeah, he, I think I could play next to him, and I'd look bloody great. I think mm. it was that kind of part of your game, kind of bringing players yes. through. Like when you saw a player, you were like, "Nah, I, I need to help him through this game." Oh, massively! Yeah, I mean, it was part of training. I used to love it in training where I'd pull lads to a side and we'd have a chat and stuff. And I felt it was part of my development as, as a coach as well. By the way, so yeah, in games, it, I'm helping you because you're going to help me here as well. Mm. Um, I'm going to help you get through this because. I don't want to be covering you, mate. You know, I want to concentrate on my game. And yeah, um, but it was a massive part of where, where I thought my strength lied within within the team because I, you know after a couple of years there, you could become respected. You played a long time in the game, and mm. boys coming through listen to you, and um, especially if you're still performing, they they listen. And mm-hmm. 
it was a massive part of my time there. Yeah, uh, there was a couple of the likes of Gary Warren, who was our captain. He was he was great at it. He was a real leader on the pitch, um, arm round the, the young kids all the time, and mm-hmm. going out of his way evenings, weekends to go and see the younger players. And yeah, it was. Um, I think it's huge. And as you say, it's when you got that on the pitch, it's missing massively, isn't it? Um, you know, just just like a, a bit of comfort for the younger players to look up and go, oh, he's been there, seen it, and he's still here. It's fine. I can do this. Do you yeah. know what I mean? Um, so yeah. Was it? You say about obviously with the springboard with using the Scottish um, uh, Premiership as that. Obviously, you've played against your Van Dykes, your, your players like that, Celtic. Let's really use Celtic as a major kind of platform for that. As see when you're seeing these players where they're at when you're playing them. And now you look at kind of the career they on, like the likes of Armstrong, Van Dijk, other players like that. Yeah. At that point, do you look at them and think, or when you're during the game, I can't remember the goal Van Dijk scored for Celtic. I think it was a free kick. And I think no. they just touched it and it was just like a 30 yard just foot. Nice yeah, part of the scored one of, Yeah, done, like, done one of them against us. Yeah. It might have been against you. <laughs> yeah. Can you kind of see then you're oh, thinking yeah. he can go on massively? Massively. Oh, huge. I mean, and. He was he was the one when he went to Southampton. I was like, how have an Arsenal, Man U, yeah. Liverpool come in for this guy? He was that good, and why he didn't? So I'll never. I mean, even Neil Lennon says himself, like, like, what's going on here? Why is he going to Southampton? Sort of thing. And the others, I mean, Andy Robertson played for Dundee United. Dundee, yep. So we, they had Andy Robertson. They had um, what's his name? You just mentioned there. Um, Armstrong. Armstrong, sorry, yeah, and. Mackay Stephen as well, who ended up going to Celtic. Yeah. They're a good sign. But I remember um, Andy Robertson looking at him, going, "You know, he looks about eighteen. He must look he even looked even younger than that. <laughs> I'll run all over him today." And um, he didn't stand out hugely, you know. I remember thinking, oh, he's, "He's good. He's quick. He's like he's he's, he's athletic." Mm. Um, and yeah, he's got a move to Hull. Oh, fair play, you know, fair play. And he, where he is now, I never saw that coming. I did not yeah. see that coming where he is now. Really? No way. Yeah, he what a player now. You know, he wasn't that player then. Mm-hmm. Um, and Armstrong as well. Yeah, what a player he is now. He wasn't that player then, as far as I could see. Mm-hmm. He was good. He was tidy. Um, I think these players get to a certain level, find the comfortable and go again. Get to that level and go again. Yeah, and that's what, yeah. yeah, that's what they've been doing. Yeah. So, um, I mean, there's been a few. There's been a few players like that where you think, yeah, didn't see you getting that to that level. So fair play. Mm. And obviously, what a lot of pe- uh, people maybe watching this maybe kind of know you from one time. Obviously, like I said, scoring that goal against was it against Celtic? Yeah, it was. Yeah. 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 What What's that like? Obviously, big stadium. Well, that was. You've, last, never, you've never had a. You've never had a. You've never had a, an easier goal to finish, surely. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you what, the angle was acute. <laughs> um, it was a last minute of extra time in the semi final of a Scottish Cup against Celtic I mean it's like what I was dreaming about as a kid you saw talking about me kicking the ball around on a, mm. in, in the street that's what that is what their moments have led to in my mind this is this is I'm a quite a deep guy and I think you, you, you have moments in your life where like it's took years to get there and that was one of them moments where when I did it the feeling I'll never never replicate ever again I don't think I, I will replicate that feeling um, do you remember pure, when it when it was coming in obviously in do you remember that kind of whole thing? And I always look at players, obviously, from someone that's never played professionally, but I always look at, at whatever level you're at. And I, even at Sunday League, and I'm looking at myself, I'm thinking, how am I here and no one's marking me? <laughs> at, 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 when, you, when obviously you did score, what do you think when you scored and when you go back, or maybe the day after, and think, oh, bloody hell, no one picked me up for that? Um, do you know what? I haven't actually thought about that, no. <laughs> if it, the way we played was obviously the two fullbacks, like, hi. Yeah. And the fact I've got on the end, it wasn't even a cross, it was a shot. The, yeah. Like uh, the cross shot was, yeah, we were chasing the last, as I say, last minute of extra time. We were trying to put pressure on Celtic, who just yeah. had a, had their man sent off. And um, I mean, I had this thing in my head where as the game was wearing on, I'm like, we are winning this game. We're winning 100%. Mm-hmm. And they equalized it to all. I'm like, it doesn't happen like this. And uh, there's all this self talk going on in my head. And I'm like, I score. I'm, this is I've seen this before in me mind because I've gone over it again and again and again yeah. and again and again. Like, and I get as I say, quite a deep guy. Like, so these things mean quite a lot to me. And in my head, I've, I've scored, and I'm thinking that the, the clock's running out. Surely I need to score soon. This, these are this is the gospel truth. Like, and people after the game said that you know they they asked me about it, and I thought I was going to score that day. And I, well, I say I thought I knew I was going to score. It was the weirdest feeling. 
And obviously when it came up, it came up. And I said to him, you know, the first thing we did after the game, I went into the change room, done all what we did, little celebration and stuff. And I got hold of my phone and went outside on the pitch straight away and rang my wife. And I said to her, um, she wasn't there. We just had a, a baby. Mm-hmm. So she was she was up in Inverness. And um, I rang her and I said, I knew I was going to score. I said, I just didn't tell you because they didn't want to jinx it. But I knew I was going to score today. And she said, did you? I said, yeah, it's the strangest feeling, a bit like a deja vu feeling. Uh, so I, I, I don't know, maybe the, I look back and I'm, as I say, deep guy, all those moments of playing and playing and playing and picturing yourself scoring winning goals in massive games. That's when it, that was, that was my moment, yeah. And we speak about obviously the FA Cup because it's been kind of very, very well publicised this year. Unfortunately, with no fans, but yeah, I have to ask. I remember watching the game, obviously against Spurs, but I remember looking at the whole journey. I'm thinking, you know, you always look at for one team in the FA Cup, and you're thinking, no, oh, they'll they'll go out. Like as a fan, I was like, no, oh, they'll go out in a minute. <laughs> yeah, they got they got that. They're still going. Yeah, <laughs> how? Yeah. And I've obviously you remember watching the game when it was on TV, and I remember looking at the manager and the and the team and everything like that. And even when you hit the crossbar in that game, I looked at it and I was like, "This is here we go. Like, gonna do it again." <laughs> what, was that? Does that kind uh, of you speak about? And I speak to a lot of coaches and even myself. And like you said, you've not got to be the most technical. Mm-hmm. If you can work harder than the other team, yeah, you <clears throat> you're you're going to be there or thereabouts. How yeah. hard working was that kind of FA Cup journey and in every game? What was it? Oh, like? It was, it was, it was. So you're talking going back to the hardest game. So Chester, we played Chester away. We got battered by Chester in preseason. Yeah. Um, we were, we were nowhere near at that point, like no fitness wise and everything. So that was a massive, and that was a tough game for us. And that was like, leave everything on the line sort of game, you know, and, and last minute like tackles and put your body on the line. And then um, that sort of gave us that springboard and confidence and impetus to, to crack on. Mm. And when we went to like Colchester, for whatever reason, I was very confident against them because the manager came up with a cracking game plan. His, his detail in the, in the coaching beforehand was like, was super. And I said to him after the game, the level you were at there, I, like some, some league managers aren't touching that. And he said, really? I said, I'm telling you now, league managers aren't touching what you did because what he was able to do clearly get across his ideas um, in more ways than one where the lads fully understood what he wanted mm-hmm. and it worked. Um, and Colchester couldn't deal with our little game plan that we had. They just couldn't deal with it. Mm-hmm. And it, obviously it went to penalties, but like I was co- pretty confident we'd win. Um, and then when we were up to having to more of Louisville, I was more nervous playing having some more to Louisville, a couple of, who were a couple of leagues down from Colchester mm-hmm. in Conference South. Mm-hmm. Um, because I thought it was going to be more of a fight. And I thought, if it's more of a fight, it's more of a leveller. They were six foot five, some of them. And I was more nervous about that um, after having beaten Colchester. So, yeah, I mean, the League Two team was probably the easiest tie out of them, too. Um, and then never did we dream we'd get on to, you know, playing spares at, at home, no chance, you know. Didn't never thought something like that would come along. How is that, like, you speak about, obviously, like, kind of thinking ahead of games and kind of mentally preparing yourself? And obviously, you're in this team as God, one of the one of the more, most experienced players there. How is that for you? You've been drawn against Spurs at home. Mm. What in your head? What, what's going? What's going on in your head at that point? Uh, honestly, what's going on in my in my head at that point is like I don't want to be embarrassed here. Um, yeah. That's the, my main, and I think like that. That's not just for Spurs, because I'm I'll be 36 next month. My main fear is, um, am I able to cope with this now is my body gonna keep going like is, i don't want it to let me down you know like mm-hmm. pace and strength and fitness and stuff like that and that's something that like niggles away at the back of your mind thinking like can you still do this can you still and that's like as you get older in the end of your career that's really something that like is quite tough to to deal with in silence especially when in the league say for instance you know you're playing non-league and there's players that wouldn't have even got me a couple of years ago yeah and, it, and now you're battling them um, and that for your ego was quite hard to accept. So going into Tottenham and playing against the elite, I'm thinking, oh, all right, you know, and Lucas Moura was up against me. I mean, we played three at the back and I voiced me concerns the way we, we set up initially. We, we hadn't played three at the back all year, but the manager had his idea and he had his <laughs> tactics. And so I, can't even, we, I thought, I, I'm looking at it just kind of quick. I'm looking at that game and I remember watching it. I'm thinking, 
no, I'm at bank bank of five, out of four and a one in front. I kind of get it. Yeah. And then I'm and then I'm thinking I'm look I saw I remember the first kind of was it the first fifteen just before they scored I was like, we did it right. It compact. Yeah, you, right. you must yeah. be know it was for you to just tell me that you you never played that all season. Oh, it's yeah. even better, mate. Even better. <laughs> no, what I mean, so it would have worked if we hadn't played Tottenham. They would obviously yeah Deli Ali. Deli Ali spotted the fact that our midfield were quite narrow and just started going boom like this so yeah. the next minute there was tons of space our midfield had to spread exactly. and it didn't it didn't work for us um and we didn't we did i don't think we reacted quick enough um and my and again i voiced my concern for lucas Moura's playing against me he had a jog he's quicker than me <laughs> so yeah i was like oh i don't want to be left out in the cold here but it didn't happen in the end we were quite compact at the back we ended up being a five instead of a three yeah um and then we changed to a four second half and we were a lot you know more comfortable. The game was gone by then and it became a bit of a yeah, you know, a bit of a sort of yeah, nonchalant game really. But mm. yeah, and it was and looking back, it was um I asked was asked after the game, did you enjoy the game? And I probably didn't enjoy the game because we got battered. We got yeah. we got a bit of a lesson. But what I did enjoy was the lead up to it and everything that's come afterwards. And I think that's what um it's opened doors and like speaking to the likes of you today. Um, you know, possibly because of that, people have been interested in my career again and gone, All oh, right, yeah, yeah, a half decent career, it's quite an interesting one. Let's talk to him about it. And exactly. for that reason, I'm might like absolutely grateful for what it was, you know, because the boys are buzzing. Like, oh, look how tall Joe Hart is and stuff. And I've never been one of them who's yeah. put these guys on a pedestal, do you know what I mean? Maybe because I'd mixed at that level, level in my earlier career. I mean, Jose Mourinho, I, I just wonder where they knew what he was doing before the game, he knocked on the door. And he, he asked for our goalkeeper, um, the, the the reserve keeper, because he's Portuguese, and he gave him a give him a shirt, and the lads were like, "Oh, look at that! That was great, wasn't it?" I'm like, "Boys, he's your enemy. Like, we're gonna play these. Stop putting them on this pedestal." So I, I went outside. I said to the manager, I "said You're gonna have to come in here and talk to the lads because we're both, we need to play these at a game of football first mm-hmm. before we can swap shirts, you know." And um, and he did. After he came the ninety in minutes, and... do what you like. I don't care. Exactly. Then. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So, yeah, that was interesting. I wonder if he did that on purpose before the game. He didn't have to do it before, but I think he. You know, I am Jose Mourinho. You are Marine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so what I like to do with all all my podcasts is we'll do a quick kind of question and answer as quick as we can, mate. I ask a question. You, you think of the first thing that comes to your head and expand on it a little oh, bit. God. Get me into trouble now. <laughs> Best player you've ever played with? Gerard. By a Best, mile. By best a mile. player you've ever played against? <sighs> See, this is tough because there's some big names I've played against, but not always cons- been the best player. Um, uh, that is tough. Because there's been so many good ones with Tony Ars out of me as well. <laughs> Trying to pick one out of them. I mean, oh God. I'll have to pick a big name out, won't I then? That's really hard to answer. And uh, so I'm going to go for, um, I don't know, Jermaine Defoe. Yeah. Put him. Yeah, I, got, I can't pick one. I, can't, I really, I, I mean, I played against Ronaldo when he was a youth team and Rooney and all that, but that's youth team, so that doesn't count. Mm. Uh, with a big name, and then obviously reserve games, big names there. But they, I don't think they count. It needs to be a first team game. Mm. Um, and then you got boys up in Celtic, haven't you? You know the likes of uh, like Forrest. James Forrest used to tear the arse out of me sometimes. And Jamie Murphy at Motherwell, he went to Rangers, yep. top player. Um, Gary Roberts again, brilliant career down south at Huddersfield and all the rest of it. For some reason, some players just tear the arse out of you, and you, you can't get near them. <laughs> and they were they were they were one of them. So there, there's a few, yeah. Favourite moment in football? Oh, I mean, goal against Celtic, yeah. Against, uh, yeah, the semi-final of the Cup against Celtic. That was, that's just a moment that, that will just never be surpassed, yeah. 100%. At what moment during your whole career did you kind of, we, like we spoke about there with, with, the, with the boys with Mourinho, at what point in your career did you ever sit there and go, wow, I'm a football player? Um, well, probably again, um, well, early on in my career, I made my Liverpool debut. But again, I didn't really feel like I was established, though. Mm-hmm. But I would probably say walking. I remember taking a moment at that semi-final against Celtic, thinking, "Yeah, this is good." This I walked out, and all the fans were singing, "You'll never walk alone," as the Celtic fans do. And 
take this minute, look around and then get focused again. And I remember that moment as a, yeah, pinch yourself moment sort of thing, semi-final in Hamden Park, proper footballer on Sky Sports. Mm. It was probably about then, yeah. Best manager you've ever worked under? Oh, that is tough, that's tough, man. I've had brilliant coaches. John Hughes is probably the best coach, like by a man. What a coach. He's up, he's up at Ross County now. Yeah. Um, but he's, he's had a couple of disasters here and there through his career. That's probably because management wise, he's not. Um, if he had like the man management say, I don't know, Arsene Wenger, then he'd be in the Premier League mm-hmm. without a doubt. Um, and I bought a guy as well, a great guy. I love the guy. I still speak to him now. And um, I'd love, I'd, I'd work with him tomorrow. Um, yeah. So coach wise on the training pitch, what a, what a, what a coach, man management, John Ward probably, um, Carlisle days. He's been around Cheltenham and Colchester, yeah. Bristol Rovers. I think quite successful. He was a great man manager, um, and Terry Butcher was a great man manager. To be fair as well, he you know. Um, so there's, there's a mixture really between managers and coaches. Like Terry yeah. Butcher did coach, but John Hughes proper on the pitch coached. Top draw. I'll probably go for I'll probably go for Yogi to John Hughes. Yeah. Favorite? Um, no, sorry. What's next in your career? What's next in my career? God, I'm floating through a bit of everything at the minute. Coaching. I want. I want to stay in the game. I want to. I want to coach at a high level. When I came off after the Tottenham game, I was like, the one thing that struck me was I want to be at that level again. I want to be at that elite level. That's like what I want. Like, oh, badly, what I'd give to be at that level. Um, you know, coaching in and, in and around that environment. Um, I mean, I started a company with a few friends of mine, um, you know, helping what we aim to um, help non-league teams. Um, nice. So, you know, that, when that comes out, obviously that will, there'll be more of that. But yeah, coaching wise, I want to be at that elite level if I possibly can and move on. And, and, and yeah, that's what I want. And last one, your best advice you'd give to any player at any level any level oh man just I, I give it all the time like, like oh, what advice can you give me and I'm like I haven't got any golden nuggets for you I just haven't just go and play football and just do everything you can today you don't put it off tomorrow just do it today so like you say I'm gonna do that I think I'll do it we'll do it today then just be the best today give everything today because this is a, you never know who's watching. You just never know who's watching and when your chance will come. So if you give it evidence today, you're ready for your chance when it does come. Um, so that's what I would say. Um, and that's all I, I ever tried to do was just try and just graft and graft and graft and graft. And it was never a chore. It was never a people to say about sacrifices. I never once, I haven't sacrificed anything. It was always, I was happy to do it. I've missed weddings and nights out and all sorts, but yeah. I felt like, I was in the right place because I'm meant to be doing this. So, yeah, just go and graft, go and do it, go and play. Just, yeah, that's, that's my advice. Amazing. Mate, that's it. You're out, you're out of questions. Um, Brilliant. It's been an absolute pleasure, mate. Um, no, everyone, make sure you like and subscribe. Um, keep an eye out. We've got more um, guests coming soon. So, yeah, please keep an eye out. But, yeah, mate, it's been an absolute pleasure. Top man. Thanks, Cheers, Thank you very much.